So, good morning. I would like to begin uh, with some thanks to the unit of co-development and the organisers of this seminar for inviting me to introduce today's proceedings in this agricultural high school. So today uh, we're looking at a very novel theme which is very important for the SAD Department of INRA which has made it one of its research priorities. In my short introduction I would like to really give you an overview of the research on territorialized food systems in INRA SAD. So SAD means uh, Science for Action and Development and the guidelines for research in this department is to study the transformation of uh, agriculture, food and the environment from a specific point of view which is to take into account the players and how the players um, use these transformations in order to move towards more sustainable development. You can see on the map of France the SAD department uh, brings together 16 uh, research units, 300 people, 200 researchers who work uh, throughout France and then there's a network of international research with Argentina and Brazil. On the right hand side of this slide you have a, a, a quick zoom in on our research themes around territorial food systems within the SAD. For a very long time we've been working on uh, agri local uh, food systems which consisted in really highlighting the terroir, the geographical indications, territorial brands in order to encourage uh, their development. Uh, we've also been working for a long time on land use, uh, land use planning and the work that has become increasingly important with the challenges of urbanization. For the past 15 years, we've been also working on peri-urban and urban uh, agriculture in order to describe its diversity and the conditions for the viability of agriculture within an urban con environment. Also the work that we can summarize as focusing on short circuits and on new forms of relocalization of food around uh, um, CSAs and uh, uh, farmers markets and school catering. And more recently we have developed work that is uh, more focused on food territories with two entry points. First of all the entry via the consumers and the question of access of consumers to food according to the nature of their food environment. And therefore, to question the, uh, to interrogate the questions of inequality of access to food uh, through the notion of foodscapes, and another aside are uh, food production territories, what we call food shares around the cities, for example, and the reflection that we will have today on uh, food sufficiency fits into this uh, point and how to redynamize uh, food sheds within the territory. Then there will be work on a recent uh, local food policies which were promoted since the law of 2014 on territorial food projects. And therefore, we offer a knowledge for diagnosis to help the players to design these policies and also to analyze food governance that is emerging within the territories. So this list of work uh, can be uh, brought together around an overall question, which is how can we reconnect agriculture, food and territories. This question is important because the current situation is uh, shows a gap. I think that you uh, talked about it yesterday and you can see that the two maps are on the left. We have the agricultural map of France which shows the regional specialization of farming and on the right we have the map of urban areas which shows the uh, polarization of jobs and a residential diffusion around the the cities into the peri-urban out into rural areas. So this question of connection is how can we organize these worlds which 
have created a gap. So agriculture is more, more focused on the export international market and a very strong urbanization of the, of the country. So this is where the research on territorial food systems are of interest because the idea is to find local methods to reconnect cities, agriculture and food. And as these maps show, in each territory the conditions are different. The uh, uh, agriculture is different. And when we talk about the share of food, we need diversity. So how can we recreate this diversity? But as uh, the headmaster said earlier on, uh, doing uh, territorial research doesn't mean being solely local, it means you need to confront the territories at different scales. And one of the uh, orientations of the SAD department is to promote international research in certain regions, and in particular the Mediterranean region. Here you can see the population densities in the Mediterranean on this map. And this region has very specific characteristics, a very high food dependency in particular of the south and east regions. These are the regions that are more depend most dependent dependent in the world in terms of food. And we're familiar with the uh, how things have sped up with climate change, uh, water uh, scarcity and uh, soil, but there's also a great wealth in agriculture, in biodiversity, in food crops, the famous Mediterranean diet, but these uh, riches are at threat. So the idea is to work on comparisons in partnerships at this scale with two main types of tools. First of all, international projects that are multi-scale and that uh, analyze at scales that go from the local level to the level of the Mediterranean basin. We will have an example later on with the presentation of the DVAR crop a project which is carried here by the co-development unit. Another tool is to strengthen scientific international partnerships, so networks of international research. And there is a, a, a project to form an international research project in INRA around Mediterranean food land, agricultural land. And uh, there is also an applied operational uh, aspect which can help local players. I'll give you a few examples here. We have urban simium, for example, which is a, a prospective land planning tool, which was developed to help uh, land development um, uh, players to have prospective data in order to develop their projects for land planning. Another way of working together is the example of a service of study and expertise backed up by a, a research lab in Paris that aims to help agricultural projects in urban areas for which the economic and agroecological models are new. And we need to find um, uh, how we can help these players. And Another example is that of ICC C local, that means here it's local, which is a collective brand which uh, guarantees on in farmers markets that the fact who's, uh, the person who's selling you the product is a producer or is selling the products of other producers or is reselling products that comes from come from elsewhere. And a final example are the territory games. These are role uh, uh, plays which, which are designed by researchers that help local actors to uh, share territorial diagnosis and mime or reconstruct uh, how things work in peri-urban agricultural land. So, I will end my introductory uh, presentation by underlining the uh, fact that this scientific subject is a really hot topic, that of urban food system sufficiency, because this raises the question of what uh, food uh, self-sufficiency actually means, which doesn't mean the territory must be an uh, must be isolated, but it's multi-scale and open, and uh, looks at how we can reinforce the resilience of our territories. And this subject is very important because new research programs are being set up within INRA, in which INRA SAD carries this approach to territorial food systems. For example, around new programs on. Uh, scaling up organic farming, a territorial bioeconomy, a climate change, or 
public health. So that's it for me. I would like to end by once again thanking uh, the Agricultural High School, the Eco Development Unit, and the organizer, organizers of today's proceedings. And I would like to wish you a very good day of work. Thank you very much. So we're now going to move on to the presentation of Project Diver Club. I'm going to very briefly present another research project. We decided to structure these two days. Firstly, the first day uh, uh, on what we've done in the Avignon uh, Centre, which is the first research project, and we need to um, talk about what we've done in the framework of uh, 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 growing knowledge. So the first day was more focused on what we've built thanks to the, our work with the city of Avignon. And this, today we'll be working on what we have learned or what we're currently learning within the scope of international collaboration within the Mediterranean that we call the Diver Crop Project. I'm going to say a couple of words quickly. It's not the heart of our topic, so it's just to give you information and to, to, to engage at a later date if you're, if you're interested in this. In any case, part of the project will be presented by Esther because there we'll be looking at the question of food uh, security, safe, safety or security. So the Diva Crop Project is an international project funded by European funds, which we're coordinating within our unit that brings together nine lands from around the Mediterranean. So uh, the objectives. Uh, there's a desire to set off from uh, the entire basin uh, and to try and uh, understand as much information as we have at the most uh, accurate level problem and to disseminate this knowledge throughout the basin to understand how the relationships uh, act between uh, land use, food production and food, not at that scale because in the scale we try to be as accurate as possible, but throughout the entire basin because we consider that there are specific challenges at that level which are not territorial challenges, which are not very local challenges, but they are specific uh, challenges, for example, of uh, climate change change, migration, and th things of this nature. So we set off from the global level, and within the global level, we try to understand the territorial system. So we're not going to spend too much time on this definition, where uh, we're uh, able to have a standard definition. But are there spatial uh, functions for the territory, land use, for example, which uh, follow a particular history and dynamics, and we try to map these territorial systems, so these small territorial entities that we suppose are homogenous and that we uh, suppose are uh, a, 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 of particular interest in our analysis um, for regulators uh, for, to regulate the Mediterranean. Uh, the way things work in the Mediterranean. So we try to map these territorial systems to understand how they change over time by looking at what's happened in the past, by understanding how things are changing now, and by making a few modest forecasts for the future. So understand the determinants of this evolution and try to evaluate the consequences of this evolution in order to raise awareness amongst possible decision makers uh, as to the possible consequences or foreseeable consequences of the uh, changes that we found in two areas in particular, biodiversity, because we work with ecologists from the Univers University of Aix-Marseille, and uh, food sufficiency, or food production, let's say. Let's not talk about sufficiency. So uh, Esther will be talking about food production later on. 
So this is a, a, a small diagram, but this is more or less what I've just said. We set off from the level of the basin and we work on territorial systems. So territorial organizations in the geographical uh, sense uh, that based on satellite imagery that we uh, cross, we, we compare with public policies. Is there environmental protection in a certain place? Or? Is there a specific national policy that protects these spaces or not? And that we also compare with more socio-economic uh, uh, materials, such as the type of uh, agriculture, the number of farms, and the economic uh, nature of the farms, etc. So we uh, compare all this and we say, here it's homogenous, here it isn't. So we do this throughout the base, and we have these territorial systems. And as we have an exhaustive view of the entire basin, we can uh, pick samples of territorial systems that we find of interest and say, well, that one, uh, something sp particular is happening here at the edge of the city. These are the places that we're interested in. And uh, we uh, carry out case studies. We interview people, say, w what are your constraints? How do you think that your environment will be changing in the near future, etc.? So we uh, do some qualitative investigatory work. And then the idea here is to scale up and to understand insofar as it is possible, whilst remaining very modest, of course, what uh, we can generalize to a broader scope and to see if these territorial systems that we've investigated in four or five places are changing in the way that people say. Uh, if that is the case, we can say that this is the physiognomy that we will see in the future. So the map uh, that you can see here, which you probably can't really quite make up, out uh, the territorial systems, you can see the different colors. If we zoom in, we can uh, uh, have far more accurate data because we have uh, pixels that represent uh, kilometers. But for example, we can see change. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly or not, but uh, in Spain and Portugal, there's a pink area there. and. That is the uh, Arantero. It is a specific agricultural area, and we can see that it is changing. In particular, it's, it's becoming more simplified, and it is disrupted by changing f farming practices currently and systems. So we can see the big systems that we recognize when you're an expert and you know the region. and. We are also looking for uh, major uh, trends in terms of change, which can ring an alarm bell because socially it's unacceptable, or, or, or we can just let the change happen if it, it's not a danger. So this is the work that we, we do in the lab, uh, with the labs that participate in the consortium, and Esther is now going to present the WP5, which is a WP focused on the question of food. Thank you, Claude. So I would like to present the uh, preliminary results on factors that uh, enable or constrain urban food sufficiency. This is at the Mediterranean scale, as Claude presented. The presentation is in English, but I will be speaking in French. So the question, the research question was, which are the factors that affect urban food sufficiency in the Mediterranean? And so our definition of food sufficiency is the proportion of locally grown food that is consumed locally. That is the definition that we adopted for the purpose of this analysis. We uh, draw the hypothesis that across the Mediterranean there are local specificities, but there are also common factors. And we're going to try and identify these common factors with a, a, a multi-scale approach of the local uh, production systems. And despite what I've written here, it, 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 we're also looking at local food consumption patterns. So uh, um, we have a multi-level methodology. 
So the first step was to identify the drivers. These are the factors that enable or constrain local food systems. And we carried out some case studies for this for specific products. So we chose one or two products that were representative for each case study. And I'll show you a map later on so that you can see where they are. Then we carried, uh, after this qualitative analysis, we carried out a statistical analysis at the city region level, or which corresponds in Europe to the NUTS 3 with a statistic PLS model, and I will present this to you afterwards. Then we uh, did a standard clustering in order to identify a typology of regions according to uh, the potential of food sufficiency. This is the map that Claude showed you by superposing the administrative boundaries of NUTS 3, or the statistic boundaries, or the equivalent, and the uh, case studies are here, so we carried these out in all countries that were partners of the project. So there is Madrid in Spain. Uh, and you can see the other P Pisa in Italy, uh, Malta, uh, Tunis, and three or four studies in Algeria, and of course there is Algarve in Portugal. So the first step, as I said, was to identify these factors using a qualitative uh, study uh, with case studies. Therefore, we developed a common uh, grid and uh, we developed the guidelines. So there's a grid to identify the key informants, which is adapted according to the context of each country and work in the field and the standard analysis of the existing literature. So here, here is the summary table of the products, representative products that were chosen by each case study. So the representativity of a project product can be a, depending on the volumes of the products, meaning that this is the uh, product that is has the highest production. So it can be in terms of volume or it can be in terms of identity, identity factors, meaning this production uh, has historically been in a certain place and uh, it represents the place and there's a, a tourist attraction with regard to these project products. So there are three types. There are horticultural products, arable crops and uh, processed food products such as olive oil and we estimated the local consumption of this local production. I say estimate it because, as you know, today we don't have any statistic data on these subjects. And therefore, to have quantified data on flows, meaning on self-sufficiency, it is thanks to the quantity of a local production that is consumed uh, uh, locally around the site of production. To do this, we need to do uh, surveys in the field. So we estimated this with an error of margin for each country, and we wanted to upscale this information up to the level of the Mediterranean. And of course, this uh, gave us some methodological problems. First of all, for the same project product, we find different percentages of local consumption, for example, meat. In Italy, uh, 70 to 100 percent is consumed uh, uh, on the production site around Pisa. However, the Inter is a very large production area, and therefore most of it is uh, sent to the export market. And so these are estimations, as I said, with the uh, error of, uh, margin of error that that represents. And in order to upscale this information with the classification of a system that we developed uh, beforehand, we could not allocate a specific uh, product. Uh, for example, for olive oil, we find the production of olive oil in an uh, uh, a forestry or a peri-urban mosaic system, etc.
Comment on fait So, how did we go about it? Well, we organize this information into uh, qualitative uh, sectors depending on uh, food sufficiency. We, we uh, found some surprising results that can be a negative and a positive force, of course. There's a tipping point. Imported products are often cheaper. And if they're cheaper, people will choose those products. But because local products are more expensive. However, local products are more expensive, but they are seen as being of better quality. So that could foster the consumption of those local products because they're seen as being better than the imported products. So that's a qualitative result. We're going to try and find the statistical tipping point there. As far as the facilitators, the enablers, we did our, we found our classical results uh, in terms of willingness of distributors and consumers that will uh, foster local food systems and the consumption of local foodstuffs. We thought that technology would play a role, internet example. For example, we thought that would make it easier for people today to uh, develop local food sufficiency. That was one of the questions we addressed. However, this is not really anything which comes into play. There was some also uh, counterintuitive results in terms of tourism. Tourism. Uh, is rife around the Mediterranean basin and is seen as fostering food sufficiency because there's, uh, the tourists want to consume local produce. We didn't expect to see that. And another factor in terms of uh, urban fragmentation, and Catherine is going to be talking about this, uh, about this uh, rugosity, this uh, fragmentation, and uh, this uh, fragmentation involves uh, farming land and uh, as far as food sufficiency is concerned the case studies which we carried out show that it it fosters sufficiency because um, these farms are smaller uh, they don't have a an export policy because they don't produce enough in terms of volume and they want to uh, sell their goods other ways, probably in a shorter chain. So we uh, addressed this uh, issue of rugosity, and Catherine's going to talk about this in detail. So we used her research a lot in, in our work. So format is important, uh, rugosity is important also. Uh, there's going to be a tipping point. Uh, if it's slightly fragmented, that fosters food sufficiency. If it's too far, that's the picture on the bottom on the right, then it does not foster sufficiency because uh, that's the way it is. So there are some kind of brackets which we have to identify and place. So that was uh, in terms of the qualitative reports. I'm now going to present the first results we have in terms of our statistics to try and cover the entire Mediterranean basin. So we used a statistical model which I'm not going to present. It's called uh, PSL. It's a uh, um, PSL, PLS model, rather, and it estimates the relationship between different variables, latent variables, which are on the screen, and they themselves are impacted by observed um, variables. So all of our qualitative results were grouped according to latent variables. There are five different fields policies, infrastructures, social innovation, 
dynamics and social conditions. So in each one, we have our manifest variables. These are things which come from our qualitative uh, analyses which we carried out, the willingness of the distributors, social innovations, uh, you finding a proxy, for example, helping uh, uh, agri-food clusters, some which can be found all around the Mediterranean basin. As far as urban form is concerned, uh, this, and this fragmentation, this rugosity, we we have well, there was plenty of information that was available. And we took this preliminary um, information from the NUT3 scale. Uh, this, don't, don't read the arrows uh, there on the, um, on, the, on the slide. The, the width of the arrow uh, identifies the, uh, the strength of the flow. You can see the figures there. The higher the figure, the stronger the relationship. And in this diagram, uh, we had the hypotheses that social innovation depends on the quality of infrastructures, on policy and social conditions, and uh, the dynamics within a system. So we can see that social conditions have a positive impact on policies, infrastructures, and social infrastructures. However, we can also see that uh, the dynamics of a system uh, are very high in social conditions, but uh, similarly, social conditions, policies, infrastructures uh, may hamper the uh, system. It will be interesting to analyze this dynamic in the future and uh, identify the uh, compl compl complex side of the uh, interactions. So what are the different factors? As I've said to you, each latent variable, you've seen some of them already on the screen, innovation, etc., etc., all late, each latent variable is a linear combination of the, man, of the manifest uh, variables. So this diagram um, will help you to understand this. We can identify which are the most important uh, links. So what are the key factors in food sufficiency? Well, we have uh, find out that in terms of the dynamics of a system, the indicators which talk about fragmentation. There are three indicators on the left. These are uh, which you can read on the screen. These indicators uh, are fragmented in terms of farmland, so these are significant indicators. We have also noted that tourism and the development index and export activities and the consumption of a product, uh, we have chosen a product which is, is present all around the Mediterranean basin. As far as belonging or not to the European Union is concerned, the quantities and national laws about food and the right to food, etc. If the system is embedded, there are three variables, production, consumption, and export. That was back in the 1980s, but it is representative. And in terms of innovation, we have the number of towns of NUTS 3, which signed the Milan uh, uh, Agreement, the number of cities where, where there is family farming, classical analysis of the clusters. And that is without the clusters which we identified. So these are just preliminary results. So the clusters uh, have a kind of NUT3 profile in terms of uh, their potential for urban food sufficiency. So there are seven types depending on uh, these variables. So we have red, for example, nuts three, the uh, 
touristic areas with uh, stronger uh, consumption than production, a lot of innovation. That corresponds to the Spanish coastline, to Madrid, for example, a big city. We can also see others, which are also tourist sites. Number four, for example, which is slightly purple, where there is consumption close to production levels. There is a, uh, an embedded farming uh, sector, very developed. In Orange, we have tourism destinations with uh, uh, Nuts 3 in Italy and with strong high production levels and an embedded sector. Very tourist area now, which consumes less than is produced, embedded sector, but f focusing more on export. And we can see that there is a European block. There's a block which is non-European. The blue there, there are two blue blocks which correspond to very fragmented peri-urban areas where consumption and uh, production is more or less balanced, but not necessarily very big in size, but uh, quite uh, um, sophisticated because they belong to networks. Three is green, much more consumption than production, not much innovation, no food laws. And uh, finally, there's the brown block. These are very fragmented regions. With production that is very high and uh, embedded. So, all of this brings out far more questions than conclusions for the time being, but this is ongoing work, as I've already said. So, what what implications can this be? These have for public policy, given these different uh, typologies. We have we were working for one specific uh, product, but we could uh, carry out the same uh, analysis using a different uh, product, for example, olive oil or a horticultural um, product. What would that? What the impact be on uh, on the different factors and variables? And um, we can talk about recommendations which could be made, for example, uh, in and around cities. So what does it mean in terms of uh, planning? And that's all I have to say. I'm sure I've got many questions. I'm sure you have some too. I'm not sure if you want to ask questions now. Or shall we hand the floor to Catherine Brinkley right now? She's got a presentation on rugosity. Uh, so our work was based in part on her research. We'll perhaps save our questions till the end of the uh, morning, just before the break. We'll do it uh, that way. So, okay, Catherine, the floor is yours. Catherine is going to be speaking in English. And so if you need a headset, uh, a cask, if you need a, a headset, please go and get one from reception. You must hand in your a piece of ID when you collect your headset, and you when you hand back your headset at the end of the day, you will recuperate your ID card. Um, and when you go out at the break time, leave the headset in the room. Yesterday, someone forgot to collect their piece of ID. She must have gone off with her headset, and we've still got that piece of ID, so we're waiting for her to come back with a headset. I work at an institution that is involved in in uh, agriculture for the future, and it's so delightful to see students in the audience today um, as we consider how the food we put in our body changes not only our bodies, but the landscapes on which we grow the food. I think these, uh, these questions are particularly critical as the Mediterranean uh, climate faces um, population growth as well as climate change. And I come from that, that same climate, California. I'm, I'm at the University of California there, which is our top agricultural university. It's only second in the world. <laughs> um, we, we got bumped down recently by a European university I won't name. Um, my background is in urban planning. 
but I'm also a veterinarian. So I approach this subject from a spatial perspective that considers the health of humans as well as the health of animals and the environment. And yesterday, I spoke about the flows of a local food system and how those flows seek to stitch together the landscape. So um, earlier, uh, Christophe Soulard showed this beautiful tapestry of the French landscape with uh, a patchwork quilt of urban areas and then incredibly diverse agricultural regions. And I would argue that this patchwork quilt has become threadbare in some places as cities have lost their connection with their agricultural regions very close by. And it is the hope with local food systems that the quilt can be restitched together so that we can have urban food sufficiency, particularly if there are threats to global food supply. And we've seen this um, uh, with Berlin, which was dislocated in World War II, it was the local food uh, supply directly around the city that sustained inhabitants. We've seen it with the economic dislocation in Cuba where the agricultural sector needed to reorient to provide urban food sufficiency. So really it's a question of uh, national security as we think about what climate change may do to global supplies of food and how cities can fortify themselves. So today I'd like to tackle that topic from a perspective of how form influences flows. Yesterday I spoke about flows, today I'll speak about form. And again, this topic is particularly critical in the Mediterranean region because the Mediterranean region is the bastion of civilization, of cities, um, as well as of agriculture. And these, uh, these co-joined Populations have grown together, agricultural lands and cities, and they're both under the threat of climate change. So to begin, uh, the metaphor that I would like you to indulge me with is that cities are like coral reefs. And I'm gonna talk about how the complex structure of cities as well as coral reefs fosters diversity, why this diversity is so important to the long-term durability of both corals as well as cities, and then I'll talk about how this diversity feeds into perfusion of the urban form. Um, and then we'll talk about the implications that, that, that exist for planning agricultural lands as well as cities. So to start, coral reefs occupy only 0.2% of the ocean, and yet they're home to a quarter of all marine life. They're incredibly durable structures which have lasted half a million years. Cities now contain half of the human population, and they will contain even more, if the UN projections are correct. And they occupy less than 3% of all land. And cities endure. They endure war, they endure being bombed, they endure economic recessions, and they grow back. So these are, these are incredibly, incredibly diverse structures uh, with the power to survive. So when we think about sustainability, we should, I argue, be looking at structures that have endured. Like uh, coral reefs that are surrounded by a diversity of, of fish and marine life, cities are also surrounded by diversity. So this is uh, a, a map of crop diversity in the US and uh, the middle of the country is very speckled, but that's because of corn and soy production, so not, not incredibly diverse in what's being produced. The Mississippi region also has a lot of corn and soy. There's a lot of diversity in the Appalachia Mountains along the East Coast. And then we'll zoom in to where I'm from in California, where you see this bright, highly speckled spot, which is the Central Valley of California. Um, so here, I, I'm, I'd like to argue that it is the farms that are around cities that supply this diverse agriculture. Particularly these peri-urban farms, they occupy only 20% of the total farmland, but they produce 90% of all fruits, nuts and berries, 80% of vegetables, 70% of dairy, 
and 50% of poultry and eggs. And it is precisely this healthy diet that we need to counter rising levels of obesity and diabetes and malnutrition. So as urban areas expand, they expand into this incredibly rich uh, soil. They take over land that is producing some of our healthiest food. Like coral reefs, cities and agricultural lands are intertwined in a way that they cannot be separated. So if we take the example of California, where the most populous state, we have 40 million people, uh, we have a housing crisis, we need to build more housing rapidly. We're also the world's fifth largest economy, separate from the US as a total, so it's, it's an economic powerhouse. We compete um, with uh, Silicon Valley and tech industries who, who need more housing and expand into agricultural land. But we also have 77,000 farms. We produce 400 different commodities. Um, over 70% of the US fruits and nuts come from California. There are a lot of similarities uh, between California and, and France in terms of being a powerhouse of agricultural production, of economic uh, vitality, of cities uh, with, a, with a long history. And here I'd like to take a pivot um, and just talk about why that diversity has been so important for the durability of cities as well as agriculture. Um, so if we start over here on the right, in ecosystems, uh, ecosystems researchers have pointed out that um, diversity is very important for recovery in ecosystems. So if you take marine diversity, um, the number of species that are there, uh, the break. <laughs> I meant to time this better so that we could, I could, I could do some sort of movement with it. Um, so the number of species in, in, a, in a coral reef correlates to the ability of the reef to recover. So if you think about one fish species becoming ill or, or, or getting a pathogen, if there are many more, they can take over that same niche and the total ecosystem will thrive. And this holds true from coral reefs to forest biodiversity. Scott Page's work has shown that diversity is important in social systems as well. So here, um, in, in the difference and in the diversity bonus, uh, he argues that the economic diversity of a city helps its overall recovery during economic recession. And we see examples of this in the US where one city is particularly reliant on, a, on an industry like an auto industry, the auto industry goes under, the entire city collapses. Whereas if you have a diverse economy, you are more protected. And this goes from the city level all the way down to the teams that you assemble to do uh, projects uh, for, for tech innovation. So if you build a team uh, that is full of people who comes from diverse backgrounds, you're better able to problem solve, uh, you're better able to market a product to a wide array of people. Diversity matters. It matters to functionality and it matters to the vitality of, uh, of the ecosystem. Why might this be? In ecosystems, this research on diversity and its ability to sustain is very well developed. So in coral reefs, it is the complex structure of the reef that allows the creation of multiple niches, habitat niches, which can then be exploited by a diverse array of organisms. That diverse array of organisms ensures that there's a perfusion, there's nutrient flow, um, there's synergies between the reef and the organisms that live on the reef, and this, uh, these niches then foster, uh, they foster resilience. So I'd like to take that argument in ecology and ecosystems, which has been very well developed, and I'm applying that to cities. So the question I have is, does urban form matter to productivity or to diversity in the city sense? What you might wonder now is, well, how do you measure that? How do you measure topological complexity? And the way that coral reef ecologists do this is quite simple, which is shocking because the reef is 
com uh, complicated. So if you zoom in at any particular space in this, in this coral reef, it's gonna look very different. And the same is true for any particular agricultural region. You may have grapes, you may have uh, orchards. It's, it's an entirely uh, different system. And the goal here is to zoom out to a level where we can come up with some universal truths for how form influences functionality. So with coral reefs, what they do, uh, reef ecologists will take a flexible rope and they'll lay it over the reef to approximate uh, the urban or the, the, the reef shape. Uh, they call this uh, complexity rugosity. So I'm taking this rugosity concept and applying it to cities. And there are many ways you could do this. So for example, you could trace the outline of nighttime lights and you could correlate that to urban functionality, to diversity, to agricultural diversity, to agricultural productivity. You could also use impervious surfaces, so paved surfaces, there are data sets for that. Or you could use LIDAR data sets which look at the height of buildings. What I prefer to use uh, in the US are US census designated urban areas. So these are uh, not politically defined uh, they are defined based on population density. Uh, they consist of 1,000 people per square mile along with adjacent, uh, adjacent dense urban areas. And what I'm able to do is to draw an outline around this urban form and then estimate the rugosity only on the perimeter, so not looking at the height of buildings. When we do this, we can pull out which counties in the US are the highest rugosity counties. And here, uh, these are the top three. The urban areas are in gray. Their perimeters are in red. And one thing that I want to draw your attention to is that the urban form is not concentric. It is not a circle. It is not simple. Uh, there are linear forms. Uh, 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 strip developments along highways are quite common in the US. Um, but there is also this fractal nature of development where cities tend to sprout. They tend to branch. Um, they don't glob outward, which is really important because the way we've conceptualized urban growth is concentric, like a tree ring, but it doesn't grow like a tree, it grows like branches. This supports a lot of the new theories we've seen in building a science of cities, this concept of a science of how urban form works and how it impacts us in our daily lives is quite new, really within the last uh, 20 years. And in that work, uh, Michael Batty has, has noted that cities tend to grow as fractals to maximize, uh, maximize their form. Uh, what I have shown empirically is that yes, indeed, they do. Uh, work by Jeffrey West and Louise Betancourt has suggested that this is a pro byproduct of how uh, roads and sewer lines feed into urban areas, that there's a a distance you can go from the road where you get less, less perfusion into the urban fabric. So now I want to take a moment because this idea of rugosity turns 200 years of urban theory on its head. Um, and it requires us to think quite differently about how we're planning cities and how we're planning farmland around it. So 200 years ago, uh, the von, um, uh, Johann Heinrich von Thunen, uh, in his dissertation in Germany, came up with this idea of the bid rent curve. And the bid rent curve notes that land values in the urban center are quite high, and they tend to taper off the further you get away from the city. Because the land values taper off, you end up with different production that surrounds the city. So on the innermost ring, you can get more value per acre for producing fruits and vegetables. That tends to locate closer to cities. We see this empirically. The next ring is dairy, and then further and further out, forest, grains, fields, crops, uh, ranching and livestock is the furthest away. This is true for California, it is true for France, that you end up with these, uh, these general patterns of um, uh, vegetable, fruit, nut production closest to the cities, and then uh, uh, poultry, cattle further away. So if we turn this on its side, the bid rent curve, um, what has happened in urban theory is that we've said, okay, we understand this happens in agricultural lands. Let's take this into an urban context. And here, uh, urban theoreticians have said that the closer you are to the central business district, the downtown, the higher the land value. And then as you move further away, 
the land value should taper off, just as they do in the agricultural bid rent curve. The problem, however, is that people pay a premium to live on the edge. They value those view sheds, they like to live near farms, and this is why we've seen developments that sprout up um, where you have high density development around farms because farm, farmland is an amenity and people pay a premium to live on the edge. This fundamentally changes how we think about designing urban form. So for example, um, if you wanted to maximize land value, if that was your goal as, as an economist, if you believe in the traditional bid rent curve, it would make sense to have a circular city because you're limiting that low value fringe. If, however, you think that the fringe is quite high value, then you would want to maximize the fringe, which would lead to a more star-shaped, high rugosity city as opposed to a more concentric city. And uh, when we plot population growth in the US over a 10-year period and urban perimeter, we see a correlation here where there is uh, uh, places that have greater edges tend to attract more people. Uh, this makes sense, they're popular. The edge is popular, people wanna live on the edge. So we move away from a very classic urban planning theory. Um, Ebenezer Howard came up with the Garden City Movement. There, all of the cities are circular. We see this circular city design over and over again. Um, and instead, we move into a model of urban development which emphasizes the edge as being high density, as being a popular place to live. Not only would you want to maximize the edge to give people more of a chance to live on it, to, to, uh, to capture that value in property taxes for the city, but you would also want to have higher density edge developments. And there are examples of this type of, of um, urban development, particularly in, in Scandinavian cities. But unfortunately, uh, this model of development has not been um, taught in a lot of urban planning programs, and so it is not the norm. Oh, wait. <laughs> OK. Um, we mentioned Le Corbusier earlier. He's a star architect that is quite commonly taught. Andre Stuani is another star architect that, that, um, that is taught in urban planning theory. And his work has found its way into practice many times. So he's come up with this idea that there should be an urban transect. The urban transect is based on uh, a classical von Thunen bid rent curve, which clusters high density in an urban center and then tapers density further off. What this does in practice, though, is limit the fringe, which is high value, to the wealthy who can afford those view sheds, um, as opposed to suggesting a different type of development. So I've, I've looked at many uh, urban plans in the US, and many of them take up the, the Andres Duani transect model, which is the top line where you would have a village limit line, you'd have higher density, and you would slower, slowly taper off. And I just want to bring home this point that if we completely reconsider how we're doing urban development, we would come up with a different transect model. If the fringe is worth so much, if so many people want to live on the fringe, if you want to capture that value, that land value, in terms of taxes, you would want a higher density fringe in addition to more fringe land, so a star-shaped city. This is important to recognize because uh, in the, the urban expansion, the Atlas of Urban Expansion, this is a global project which looks at cities. And many cities are continuing to expand, but they're expanding with very low density. And this means that you're eating up the most productive agricultural land in exchange for a not very efficient development model. And not only is it not efficient in terms of capturing the value of the land and degrading the most productive agricultural soils, but it's not productive for transportation, it's not productive for social cohesion, it's not productive for, um, for, for creating more vibrant cities. And this is exactly the type of frayed fabric that local food systems are trying to transverse as they, they um, discourage low-density suburban development.
Another problem with this type of development, which we've seen in extreme, particularly in the US, is when you allow low density development, you degrade your downtown. So unfortunately, this is the case for many US cities where the downtown has died. Stores have moved out of the downtown, people have moved out of the downtown, they've exploded into the suburbs which have inefficient transportation lines, they've paved over farms, um, and we've devalued the very city as well as the property prices. We're seeing this change a little bit, but a, a lot more needs to be done to reverse the trend. So here I'd like to propose a theory for why this happens. Um, if we consider an urban area as this ellipse here, and we consider goods and services perfusing across the urban perimeter, you'll end up with an area, which I've labeled RC there, where you, you are very well perfused. It's easy to get goods and services. This might be why people want to live on the edge. We have a, a mysterious connection with nature. We like to look at it. We are psychologically, we feel better when we do look at it. Um, and then you have uh, a, an urban area which is not as well perfused. So what I'm arguing here is that you reach a certain thickness in the urban fabric where you just can't perfuse it with goods and services as much. And this may sound quite crazy because you think, well, urban fabrics are really huge. You know, I don't know, does this really play out in actuality? And one way we can look at this is we can, um, we can bound urban areas, this is in pink, with, um, with rectangles and squares to approximate their size. And we can say, when you get to a certain size of square, do you tend to elongate and become a rectangle? Do we tend to form branching structures like a coral reef? Or do we, do we just glob outward and outward and outward? Are there consequences? And when you plot urban areas in the US, this is a plot of about 44,000 urban areas. Sure enough, you get to a certain urban thickness where instead of growing as a square, you tend to elongate, you branch. What's important to note here is that more than half of the urban areas in the US do not approach this perfusion constraint at all. They are quite small. Um, and the places, there are 0.2% there are, um, that have extended beyond this constraint, the largest of which is Los Angeles, which defies any type of urban theory <laughs> at all. So more than half of all the urban areas are less than half a kilometer from their, their fringe. And again, this should, this should tell you that there's a premium on, on the urban edge. People want to live uh, close, to, close to the fringe. The story of Los Angeles, I think, is, is particularly important because this was very rich agricultural territory. Um, in the 60s, Los Angeles was covered in orange groves. Importantly, most of those growers did not sell directly to the city. So those social network connections, that fabric, that thread of local food systems was not there. And the tapestry completely pulled apart. And um, this past year, the last orange grove in Los Angeles was put up for sale to become an urban development. Another important feature of the rugosity concept is that it has ecological benefits. So we're seeing some of this work um, in urban ecology, where cities are struggling with an urban heat island uh, effect. And this is particularly important with climate change, as in many northern European cities, there's not air conditioning. Um, it's hot, heat waves kill. Uh, they're going to be one of the biggest killers with, with climate change in urban areas. And so this question of how can we dissipate the urban heat island effect has come to the forefront in a lot of policy debates. And um, urban ecologists have noted that when you have green wedges that perfuse cities, you're able to dissipate that urban heat island effect. Instead of concentrating it, uh, you're able to send it further out. There are also benefits in terms of water recharge, water filtration, stormwater management. These are very important with climate change as we expect to see more storms and we will need green infrastructure to help us manage those storms. So thinking about how to redesign our cities to better fit into their environments and take advantage of those environments is becoming increasingly important. All right, 
So now I'm going to take you to where I live. <laughs> um, uh, the University of California Davis is right here in this little uh, urban blob. Um, we're 15 minutes from Sacramento, which is the state capital. And I'm pointing this out to say that the research that I'm presenting today is, is an average. Because there is so much um, heterogeneity, and particularly in agricultural and urban data, you can't take this, uh, this big universal picture and apply it specifically to every place. Um, Napa is a great example. So you have incredible agricultural diversity where I live, and then you just have grapes and delicious wine in Napa. So they've, they've gone a different route. Just because you have urban development doesn't mean that you're encrusted in high diversity agricultural production. So the next question I'd like to present is what is the value of the urban edge? How much can you expect to get an agricultural value for the urban edge? And this is an important question because one of the concerns that farmers have if you're talking about increasing the urban space is that that's going to increase the land values. And if you increase the land values, they need to produce more, they need to change what they produce, or they need to sell and retire. Um, those are the options. So there's a very big concern over what um, urban forum does to the agricultural area. To answer this question, I've done a, a spatial multivariate regression analysis. It's stepwise, and the reason you do a stepwise uh, analysis is to really tease out how much your variable is worth. So the first variable is California. If you do not control for agricultural production in California in the US, you throw off your entire model because it's such a huge producer. Um, so if you're a county in California, you can expect to, to, um, to gain at least uh, <laughs> uh, $300 million in agricultural production. The next thing that I've controlled for is the population. So really what I want to do is, is control for California, control for population, control for farm makers, um, control for um, competition, and look in farm makers and look at only the urban interface. And here what I find is that for every kilometer of urban interface, you can expect to increase agricultural sales by about $215,000. What this means is that that urban interface has a direct impact on agriculture. And the next question you may ask is, does that push farms out of business? So in order to answer that, uh, I did a comparison of counties that had statistically different rugosities, different urban edges, but had very similar county populations, total acres, um, and sales. And what I found is that there was no difference in farmland loss. So what happens when you increase the urban interface is that you change the type of agricultural production. Uh, a good example of this is the Delta region where I live in California, that northern part of the Central Valley. Um, is The Bay Area is expanding, the housing market is coming out, and in order to compete against that housing market, which is unfortunately low density development, farms are converting from uh, commodity crops of rice to uh, higher value crops like walnuts, almonds, grapes. So the farms adapt. And you will see a difference in the total value of agricultural sales with the counties that are in more rugos areas outperforming agriculturally those that, that are in less rugos counties to offset the increase in the value of land and building. So the whole system shifts which is again why you can't consider urban development completely divorced from agricultural development, nor can you talk about planning agricultural systems for food sufficiency without considering the urban dynamics. You have to consider both together. So to conclude, um, <laughs> uh, there is a cultural adjustment that we, that we need to uh, to seriously consider as we think about how we plan our cities. Do we want to continue to expand outward in concentric rings, or do we want to shift and think about what high density edge development might do, how we could orchestrate that? Uh, when cities consider annexing land because they need to annex land in order to build housing for population, should they make a commitment to building high speed transportation to uh, to preserving farmland on either side and to um, 
to building high density development because it's all too easy to annex just a little sliver and allow a small housing development that's very incremental. It doesn't require a ton of investment in infrastructure. But over the long run, you're adding on costs for maintenance of roads, for maintenance of sewer lines. You're devaluing your agglomeration economy at the very center of the city and devaluing your best producing soils. Cities also need to think about how farms and green space around them play a vital role in perfusing the city with goods and services. So as cities consider updates to their sewage systems to handle storms or rainwater, um, they, sh they should consider the services that surrounding areas can provide. And a really good example of this actually is in New York, where the city was faced with building a new wastewater treatment plant that was going to cost um, many millions of dollars. And instead of doing that, what New York decided to do was to buy the rights to develop on farmland up, uh, upstream from, from Manhattan in, the, in the, the Catskill Mountains, which meant that that preserved all of that land from development uh, the water could be filtrated naturally through the farm and the forest land. And now if you ever have the chance to go to Manhattan and drink tap water, it is some of the most delicious tap water you will taste. <laughs> and that's because they've invested in ecosystem services. Large cities like Philadelphia are doing the same thing and thinking about how to revamp their combined sewage systems, how to uh, fit cities with, um, with, with uh, green space that, that can provide those services. Another thing that I think we need to all be uh, uh, cognizant of is that populations are going to continue to go up um, in order to avoid um, uh, uh, um, riots and, <laughs> and, and, and social unrest. Housing needs to be built. Uh, that, that needs to be taken quite seriously. And where do we put that housing? Um, who grows up in, in the, those housing developments? Are they able to join uh, the, the vibrant cities? Um, are they able to participate in, in, in a vibrant economy? And for this, we need to consider that the edge is a desirable space and, and to plan for it accordingly. With this, I would like us to also consider that cities naturally branch as they develop. And that branching thickness tends to be about 10 to 30 kilometers. So we have some specs now for how we might develop cities efficiently. The question is forming those coalitions in, in agricultural ter territories to decide long range plans of who is going to get developed, how is that development going to happen, um, who's going to continue to produce food, um, and what will the ultimate shape of the city take. So there are some key planning recommendations that we can use to put this in action. The top one is that we could institute non-concentric urban growth controls. And as I pointed out, in many American cities at least, there's this idea that uh, when you have an urban growth boundary, it needs to be concentric. You want to fill in those green wedges with urban fabric. You don't want to preserve them. And I, uh, the, the data that, that I've shown you shows that this isn't going to be good for urban heat island effects. It's not going to be good for uh, the agricultural economy. And it won't be ultimately good for, for the city either. Um, we need to protect those green wedges. And one way to do that is with strict farmland protection. You're in a country that has stricter farmland protection than we have. So you can look at our model of how well it's worked or hasn't worked. And a wonderful example of this is the Copenhagen Finger Plan. So uh, this plan was produced in 1947, and the goal of the plan was to have uh, very efficient transportation. So it's uh, transit-oriented development where along each finger you have a rail line, there are several major cities, it's high-density development, and then because Denmark is quite small and, and wants to be food sufficient, the green wedges are protected for agricultural land. While this plan was originally uh, orchestrated for transportation, it has worked quite well uh, for farmland protection as well as for urban development. Over time, the fingers have become a little bit squatter, but the form is still, is still largely there. Another thing that we need to consider is high density fringe development, particularly around amenities. And this is really tricky um, because a lot of those places are coveted 
for being rural, for being rural in, in character, and we need to think about how to contiguously expand the urban fragment, uh, the, ur the urban fabric, not fragment it. So not put high density developments that aren't connected to the urban fab fabric, but to extend the urban fabric incrementally and in a way that's sensitive to preserving the amenities, but is also sensitive to the land value that is generated from those amenities. And we can do all of these things with, with regulation. And, and, and yesterday I spoke about how it was those local food system actors who were involved in urban environments, but were also involved uh, on the farm who helped make these plans for preserving farmland, for extending urban development. Those actors need to be at the table. And I think an important way to foster them being at the table is to create economic spaces that allow this. This has been a, a huge historic issue in American cities because we used to have 200 years ago thriving markets that were local in nature and since then because of public health regulations because of planning regulations we have closed those markets we have made it impossible for farmers to come into the city to sell product and we have lost those threads that connect the farm to the urban environment that allow us to plan together for urban expansion and for farmland protection Ways to support that economic piece would be to allow more farmers markets. Example of this, Philadelphia, there's a waiting list of, um, of neighborhoods that would like farmers markets and there's a waiting list of farmers that would like to have a space in a farmers market. There's demand on both sides. It's just a matter of uh, reconfiguring some of the ordinances that allow farmers markets to take place. But we can also do this with agricultural extension we can do this with multifunctional agriculture. And again, this is a, a very contested land use ordinance. So in some ways, what I'm arguing here is that planning needs to get out of the way. It needs to remove some of the barriers to allow multifunctional agriculture. It's not necessarily a need to, uh, to organize actors. They will organize themselves as long as you give them the space to do that. And with that, I will conclude and open for questions. Des questions Uh, I will begin. You're pre very convincingly presenting the relationship. So you convincingly present the relationship between rugosity and the fact of optimizing the number of possible contacts and therefore the agricultural situation. But could you maybe speak to us about thresholds, the time at which it becomes a constraint? Because I've understood that it can be a, a planning objective to encourage these urban organizations, but at a given point, the planning must also be able to bring the phenomenon to a halt in order to protect the surrounding area. So where is the balance? I think this is where my research interfaces your research as you think about um, uh, what can be produced in a country and will that be enough to feed everybody? So there's, yesterday we talked about the difference between food sheds and food prints, a food print is this idea that this is what we need to eat. And a food shed is, this is the available land that we have to grow that food on. And then there's another question, just because you have the available land and you need to eat does not mean that you're making that direct connection. Um, and that direct connection is very important for keeping that land in agriculture versus making the decision to uh, import your food supply and become vulnerable to the vagaries of economic downturns and national politics. Um, so I think in, 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 in one respect, your question can be answered by um, spatial analyses of 
what could be produced in the food shed. But uh, in order to preserve that food shed, you need to have uh, a certain amount of flows to urban areas to build a shared understanding about how to plan your urban areas. And that, this is what's so exciting at this moment in time with the birth of the Science of Cities movement is that we're understanding these accretions of human intellect as we build cities around us and we're starting to understand how we manipulate the landscape and what the consequences are and we can form a science to figure out how to do it properly. And that science is going to be very different in different contexts. Um, so you may have, you know, regions where it makes more sense to have cities. Uh, you may have regions where it makes more sense to have agriculture. But I think all too often we founded our cities in places where we had fertile soils to begin with. And you can't just decide to put a city someplace. I mean, some countries have decided to put cities in places where there wasn't agriculture, but uh, we have to grow on the scaffolding that we've originally put in place. So I, I think um, the urban perfusion gives us an idea of the thickness of the urban fabric from the urban side, but then of course we'll have to do more modeling to see if you grow, what are the impacts on land values for agricultural production, how quickly can farmers adjust to those increases in land value um, by shifting to different crops, by marketing in different ways, by producing other goods and services for cities. So one thing I didn't talk about today was uh, peri-urban farmland tends to be a wonderful spot for uh, energy, renewable energy in, in particular, so solar, wind on farms. And this is another opportunity for uh, for farms to create something of value that is needed in urban areas and to create it on the urban edge so we don't have giant transmission lines. So I think we're going to have to think more broadly about food energy and water, not just the food side, which is going to complicate the models, of course, because you may create a model that says, if we diversify this much, if we change our marketing, we can expect to get twice the value per hectare, which we've seen with direct marketing. But then if you add in, and we add solar, which or we add wind, and this will counteract some of the land value, because we've seen this with a lot of energy production, particularly waste to energy, that it, it, it can change the land values in a different way. So there's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of modeling <laughs> to figure it all out. <laughs> Juste pour information, en France, il y a un, un ensemble de lois qui nous arrive où on dit ça, il faut évaluer les conséquences de la croissance urbaine sur l'agriculture la, et on s'aperçoit qu'on ne sait pas très bien faire. Donc, It's just a short comment uh, because I really liked your presentation and I thank you. Uh, when I started to study peri-urban agriculture um, and uh, in Italy, <laughs> Italy is, is if, you, if you look a map of the urban sprawl in Italy, your comment is, oh my God, peri-urban agriculture is everywhere in Italy because the urban sprawl in Italy is really dramatic. Mm -hmm. We have uh, an amazing cities, but uh, <laughs> the countryside, uh, not, it, it is not always so protected. And uh, I, when I started to study these uh, things, uh, they told me that I studied that uh, this kind of urbanization that we have in Italy, it's the worst urbanization because it affects directly the rent of the land for the, mm -hmm. of the agricultural land. So it is a problem, a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started to, um, to, uh, to reflect how to uh, think in, on the opposite side. So make the lands that is between that you uh, to make more valuable in order to protect these lands. But I agree with you that is a 
complex uh, study and we have to model a lot, we have to study a lot and to be very, um, to look really the reality of each, sometimes also of each municipality because uh, the policies sometimes is very, very local. Mm. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Because Thank you for that comment. I think what you're saying as well is that it's one thing for us to create a science of cities or a science of agroecology and quite another thing for us to change our cultural pattern of how we develop because there is a there's a cultural heritage to the landscape that gets changed if you decide to follow a scientific model of how to how to grow um, and, and we have to do some serious some serious thinking about what culture we're perpetuating and what the consequences the economic the ecological consequences are. You showed us urban growth, which is continuous. In France, we have uh, cities that have been developed on very good farming land. Uh, and we try with our tools to protect this uh, farming land. But is there reflection, I don't know where or at which level, about how we conciliate uh, uh, growing population, demographic growth, and uh, preservation of very good agricultural land. The continuous uh, urban growth and the growth of metropolises will eat up a very high value agricultural land and I think that this is very harmful so is there a, a reflection at a more global level um, I, thank you for the question I think this is particularly difficult because people have to eat and we need water and we need energy and farmland also needs water uh, and there's this conflict, particularly over water, between urban areas and agriculture. California is a, is a wonderful example, but the entire Mediterranean is a fabulous example, where we have the sunshine, we have the soil, the world needs food, um, and, and water supplies in many places are, are being diverted because urban populations have more, uh, more funds for growth. I think um, there's a lot of tweaking we could do about how we do urban development, where we, we uh, capitalize on um, scale. So if you build a large apartment building, that's the same amount of road and, and, and sewer as if you build one single family home. So we, ne we need to do some serious thinking about how we're building new housing. And, the space and the resources that it takes up, not just in, in that development project, but long-term maintenance. Um, I, I think as well, in a lot of uh, urban cities in the US, this is not the case for many European cities, we have so devalued our center city and so sprawled over our farmland that we end up with um, uh, city centers which are vacant and there are, there's possibilities to reinvent those city centers with, with infill at, at this point. And that, that, that is a big conversation, but that's not necessarily the, the situation in France. And, and um, this is where I think Esther's work on fragmentation is important because contiguous growth is one thing where you're extending road and sewer and you're not reinventing a system and you're capitalizing on economies of scale and agglomeration economies but then having a city here and a city here and a city here and a city here um, or, or new suburbs that are founded on, on, on a farm and are not well connected is not, uh, doesn't create the best bus lines, the bus train lines, uh, the best sewer systems. It doesn't allow you to, to aggregate that human capital. And um, another thing that we're seeing in the US is that cities under 60,000 people really struggle economically. Uh, they struggle to keep their downtowns open, they struggle to keep their stores open, they struggle for jobs. Um, so it, it, in some senses there's this balance between 
uh, what size city we have and how those cities grow. We can answer some of that with modeling, but again, it gets back to the culture question. Do we, do we all want to live in a, in a metropolis? If it's a, if it's a metropolis that's 10 kilometers thick, is that okay? Or do, do rural villages, you know, and, and we don't have to make these big decisions all at once. It's all gonna be rather incremental. The goal is really to provide guidance on uh, if you do want to allow a suburban development Here's the long-term cost of that. Here's what's being lost in terms of food production capacity. It's absolutely amazing to create models like this and to see how we can, in fact, develop, how we can do town planning, how we can construct. However, I think that this notion of growth, we have to put an end to it because these megapolises, well, they have been built up. All cities have been built in good land zones because uh, when in the olden days you would you would build your first house where it was easy to grow things to eat i think that in uh, zones where there are some mountains or where there are railway lines there is public transport i don't understand that with the methods that we have today with internet and with all this paperless uh, world we live in all of the work we can do elsewhere that there is no political commitment to ensure that these smaller places are being grown where there are already buildings. You just need to renovate them. There are already the roads and we could have people working there. But there is this, I don't understand why people all concentrated in uh, the city. Obviously the factories, you're not going to move them, but for the, ser the service industry, why not ship them to the uh, smaller places? And I think we have to set the limit because we have to uh, find that yeah, the, de the definition will be different from one model to the next, but model to the next. But you have to find your limits. If we continue to grow like this, well, um, if I may, an example: uh, the little city that I live in, in Davis, has decided that it has set that limit that it only wants to grow at one percent, and they don't care that there's a housing crisis. They don't care that. Um, that there's a homelessness crisis in California. They don't care that they're right next to a university that is continuing to grow in population. And so if you think about what that does on a very micro level, it creates scarcity. And when you create scarcity in economic systems, the housing prices go up. So it, we have priced out um, low-income people in this city. Uh, we have walled off the city for, for urban development, and that that creates incredible inequity. Uh, that's the, an example of a small city that has, that has said, I don't wanna grow. I think uh, to your other question about saying, there's a point at which we just won't take it, not everybody has to live in a city. Um, the reason that, we, that we're drawn to cities is because there are efficiencies there. And there's been some incredible work on these efficiencies um, by um, theoretical physicists, actually, who are, are, are um, finding that people walk faster in cities. We're more efficient at walking in cities. Um, things, things move more quickly. Ideas flow more quickly. There are more patents per capita in cities. Um, there's more GDP produced per capita in cities. That doesn't mean that you move to a city and you're suddenly wealthy and more creative. It, it, it means that cities, because of being in close confines with each other, we're able to share ideas. We're able to build something more quickly. Um, and so I, I do think that certain cities are trying to say, no, no more growth. And, and other cities are very reluctant to accept that with climate change, um, we have refugees from climate change. Um, we still have rural to urban migration patterns in many places in the world where housing is desperately needed and cities are growing and they're not producing that infrastructure. And so they end up with giant slums. Um, that, that need to be, uh, you know, that have, that have huge health risks for globally. Um, so th these are very complicated dynamics and, I, and, and, it, and it's quite difficult to say, um, to draw a line in the sand and say that we, we will not grow or I will not do this or we should reorient the entire economy to, um, to provide opportunities for small towns. Some small towns are being quite creative about that with their economic development, but they're fighting a tide which is pushing 
pushing people towards the efficiencies that, that they can get in cities, where if you're a firm uh, and you're, you're in a city, you're located near you know, all your competitors and all your collaborators, you're able to learn from them. It, it, um, that, that is why, that is why we, we get that, that co-location. We'll just have a couple more quick questions because time is running on. Andrea Cardoso, I'm Portuguese. Uh, I'm landscape architect. So I um, enjoyed very much your presentation because it links um, land use planning maybe with uh, urban planning. So it's, uh, it's I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, I worked uh, on my PhD. I modeled food sheds considering ecological factors. Um, like soil, water, climate, according to different diets. So um, we call that ecological-based food planning, and it's very, it's, um, it goes in line with what landscape architects do to, to think about land use, considering suitability, land suitability to different uses. So I'm, I, I agree very much with the idea of um, uh, that lady that spoke about the limits, because I think urban form should be limited to areas where there is ecological suitability for edification, and also agricultural areas should be planned according to, to agricultural land suitability. So I worked that also with crops, suitability for specific crops. And so I, I'm quite interested in knowing uh, what do you think about the idea of considering agricultural areas form and using uh, your knowledge to study the optimal agricultural land form. In a way, we could reverse this idea of always thinking about urban form, what is the ideal urban form, and we don't make the, other, the things the other way around, since we completely depend on, on land to, to feed ourselves. Thank you. If I've understood the question correctly, it would be, why don't we flip this notion of planning cities and instead talk about planning farmland and go from there? Um, I think that's complicated because the urban form dictates the value of the land. And because it dictates the value of the land, it dictates uh, the production that needs to happen there in order to stay in business. So. Uh, we are starting to see some exciting developments with vertical farming, um, aquaculture, where soil is not needed. And um, I don't know, yeah, I, I don't know if those can be scaled up to the point where, um, where, where we can, you know, we can, we can, we can do it differently. Uh, but I, I, I think it, landscape architecture, you know, we spend, I, it's, it's, where the university, um, we have landscape architects in my department, and one of the things that we've talked about recently is that we spend a total of 4% of our time outside, 4%. When you think about the time you spend sleeping, the time you spend inside, and, and yet we know that we have this uh, connection with nature and with the environment, which is important for our psychological well-being, which is why we see studies where if you put a window in a classroom, students perform better than a windowless classroom. We know this, uh, and we know how important it is, but we don't, um, but it's become such a small part of our daily lives. And I, I, I'm with you in mourning the fact that we don't plan it more into, um, more into the places that we inhabit. Do you think the regulations uh, and uh, plans could change uh, uh, could change that could change the paradigm? You spoke about the the land value mm -hmm. and why it is impossible to plan agricultural areas mm -hmm. with the same care than we do for urban areas. So. Mm -hmm. 
a, a lovely example of that is urban agriculture, um, and <laughs> particularly on vacant lots, because cities are so hesitant to allow urban agriculture because they know that once they allow those communities to take over that land, their communities are going to resist any type of development on that land. Um, so, so regulation that allows agriculture back near cities, I think, is very important, and even within cities, um, to, to interweaving interweaving food producing lands with with urban areas and I, I entirely understand the uh, the hesitation there because once people start producing food they eat the food together they talk together they value the land in a way that's different than the economy and then they demand politically to take that land out of out of economic circulation <laughs> Well, that will round off the discussion that we've uh, just had here. I'm really interested by the type of farming which is growing in opal op in the models which you've described. I've uh, grasped that uh, there's development in the fringes, the populations are growing, and that has an impact on the value of land and on the agricultural choices in terms of the added value of what is grown. So what uh, farming system is implemented, and that begs the question of accessibility. Also, because we are going to have productions which have a cost, and you say that uh, town centers uh, are being emptied and people are moving to the fringes, but uh, the question will arise of financial accessibility, the affordability of uh, farming land in the fringes. So what kind of farming methods are introduced? Um, the, the farming, farming that, that um, in high rugosity counties, they tend to have more diverse agricultural production that emphasizes fruits and vegetables and nuts, particularly trees and vine crops, because those allow agritourism possibilities as well. And that's not to say that every uh, farm has to do that. So an example uh, in Yolo County, where the University of California Davis is, there's a lot of rice production we don't often think of that commodity as, as having agritourism possibility, and yet uh, there's a lot of bird watching that can happen uh, in, in rice fields, a lot of hunting that can happen. Um, there are food festivals that can happen. So it's not only that the production changes, but also how that production gets shared, whether it's, um, and again, we see in high rugosity counties, those tend to be counties with more direct marketing, um, more direct sales. So there's a, a more of a connection. I agree with what you're saying. Yes, there's a lot of market gardening, but uh, let me be a bit more concrete. So how much does a kilo of tomatoes cost in those particular towns in production conditions and given the value of the land? And is that tomato available to the people who live in the city? Uh, um, well, there, there are, tomatoes are tomatoes and then there are tomatoes. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm, uh, yesterday I presented on, on the value that can be received with direct marketing and that uh, you can get twice the value through direct marketing, but usually the varietals are quite different. So you might have heirloom varieties um, as opposed to the tomatoes that you grow for canning. So on a per acre basis, you can increase the value, but it, it requires more labor, it requires different uh, different marketing, different harvesting, different growing techniques. And, and this, again, is why um, you know farmers are quite leery of urban expansion and urban development because it means a change in land value which means they are going to have to change how they produce. A way around this would be to say um, uh, we are going to tax farmers differently. Um, so we do this with um, estate taxes in the U.S. where if you keep the land in agriculture for a certain amount of time uh, then you have an exemption. Uh, you could do this with land taxing as well where you say it's one thing for uh, this uh, property tax to be based on development potential and it's quite another for it to be based on just production use. So a way that this has been done, I mentioned uh, 
New York, they bought the development rights from the land. And that means that that land can never be developed. Um, it can only be used for agriculture or forestry. That reduced the value of the land, which the farmer got the money for selling the development rights up front. Um, and that also means that, that the taxing structure is different. So there are regulatory ways that you can do this. Of course, you need the farming community to be willing to say, I want to keep this land in agriculture in perpetuity as opposed to this is my retirement uh, fund. Justement, par rapport, et pour conclure, je sais qu'il y a d'autres questions, mais je vais faire ma dictateur. There are surely many more questions, but because I'm, in, I'm the boss here and we're out of time, I'm going to wrap up. In tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to visit three farms, very urban farms, around Avignon, three completely different models uh, of uh, running farms and uh, uh, how they use their land and how they sell their produce. So these questions questions that we're all thinking of now about tomatoes, we can ask the growers tomorrow how much they sell their tomatoes for and can they get a higher price because you're growing here and what's the relationship with the cooperative. So we will see all of that tomorrow and we'll hear from the farmers tomorrow who very kindly have accepted to uh, host us. I'd just like to end with one question which sums up what everyone has said because Catherine lives in States uh, where things are different when you're doing your town planning, you don't have the same laws, you don't have the same uh, cosmology. I would just like to know, I'm going to ask this in English, that when you were making um, field work, you presented yourself as an, as an officer of agriculture, uh, issues on urban planning department. So I would like to know if this question of agriculture and food, or maybe the Nexus Water Food Energy, is already been tackled, tackling or not in the urban planning or department in, in California, not in the USA, but in your place where agriculture is very important as, as an economic, economic, economic key economic sector? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, California takes its water supply very seriously. It knows that its water supply influences urban areas and agriculture and knows that it's the breadbasket for, for the United States. So water, food, and this is also a state that, that is committed to reducing greenhouse emissions through um, renewable energy and very ambitious renewable energy goals. So it's, it, it's, it's a little bit different than the rest of the United States. <laughs> um, that said, the, the, the national government has also realized that this connection between food, water, and energy is of national importance in addition to state and city importance. And they have made grants available to tackle these issues, um, which is spurring a development where researchers are mapping um, food sheds, water sheds energy sheds, and then thinking about how the reconfiguration of those sheds uh, and their supply lines will ultimately change where food is produced and, and where we can build housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, bon. nous pouvons aller pour la pause café. We can go out for 15 minutes coffee break now with a little bit behind schedule as usual, but let's try and get back on track.